to work together. Our great thanks to you, MJ Gohel of the Asia Pacific Foundation. We thank you very much. You focus on security and terrorism issues, and we're, we're glad you could come to visit with us today. Thanks very much. You know, if adults feel insecure, how much more so must children feel? From the first moments of the attack, we have seen one disturbing image after another, the planes piercing those towers, the World Trade Center towers like flaming arrows, people jumping from buildings that moments later crumbled into a storm of debris. How can we describe to our children what is happening in terms that they understand without taking away the security that they need to feel. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. First, though, let's go back to Jim Clancy and Colleen McEdwards for the latest news on the investigation into the attacks and certainly the search and rescue and recovery mission. Jim and Colleen? Mm, it's a great right. topic, isn't it, Don? I know a lot of my friends are talking about how they talk to their kids about this. What do you say? What do you do? You have to be thinking about that and addressing it and talking to your children. Probably get some good tips here in the coming minutes, but let's get up to date with the latest developments in the story itself. Searchers have recovered the cockpit voice recorder from the hijacked plane that crashed in western Pennsylvania. It was recovered at the bottom of a deep crater. Now it's being sent to Washington for analysis. This was the plane that is believed to have crashed after a struggle between passengers and the hijackers. And in other developments, Congress has passed a joint resolution authorizing President Bush to use military force against those responsible for the attacks. And authorities say that they've made their first arrest in the investigation, a person who was picked up as a material witness. Well, a resolution was passed by Congress that had been delayed by a dispute over the text. The House finally approved uh, a measure late Friday, 420 to 1, endorsing uh, the president's ability to act militarily. Representative Barbara Lee was the lone dissenter. The California Democrats saying military action will not prevent international terrorism against the U.S. The Senate had already voted unanimously in favor of that resolution. One senator says the body is single-minded in its desire for action. Ten years ago, I helped draft the resolution uh, that uh, George Bush, then president, won the Gulf War with our coalition allies. It was three days and three nights of ferocious debate on the Senate floor, and it prevailed by only five votes. This one is 100 votes. What clear evidence, Senator Levin and I worked on the drafting with our leadership of this, what clear evidence of the unity in the Congress and the Congress speak for the people of the United States. Meanwhile, at the request of the Defense Department, Mr. Bush has given the go-ahead for as many as 50,000 National Guardsmen and reservists to assist with so-called homeland defense plans. And uh, the president... Sorry, the president got a first-hand look at the site in uh, lower Manhattan known as Ground Zero. Amid the rubble of the Twin Towers, Mr. Bush spoke to rescue workers who responded uh, patriotically. Take a look. Got it. I, uh, I want you all to know it can't go any louder. I want you all to know that America today, America today, is on bended knee in prayer for the people whose lives were lost here, for the workers who work here, for the families who mourn. This nation stands with the good people of New York City and New Jersey and Connecticut as we mourn the loss of thousands of our citizens. I can hear you! <laughs> I can hear you, the rest of the world hears you, and the people and the people who knock these buildings down will hear all of us soon. By pushing and compassion. Me. Oh, sorry. No, 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 sorry. To everybody who is here. Line on that one. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you for making the nation proud. And may God bless America.
Let's get back a little bit, folks. You can imagine what a morale booster that was because the pressure on those folks, the search, rescue, and recovery teams has been just unrelenting. The search is a race against the clock to reach anyone who could still be alive in that pile of rubble. For one blind survivor who managed to get down hundreds of feet of stairs in the chaos with his guide dog, memories of that attack still very fresh. Listen. I uh, was very concerned. I didn't hear the second plane hit, but we knew that at that time, Something had happened. We, we figured that a plane had hit the building because I could smell and we all could smell uh, jet fuel fumes. So we knew there was something going on. And it is the victims and their families that were the focus of Friday's National Day of Prayer and Remembrance designated by uh, U.S. President George Bush. At the National Cathedral in Washington, patriotic songs led the way as Mr. Bush joined four past presidents and other dignitaries in a display of grief and an attempt to comfort as well. Prayers and services were offered in other churches, synagogues, mosques, and public squares right across the country. In Las Vegas, the bright neon lights dimmed as the Nevada city paid its respects as well. Farther west in the state of Washington, candles flickered at a Seattle vigil to remember the lives lost and affected by those terrorist attacks. Well, it's a struggle for anyone to come to terms with this week's horrible loss of life, but children have to rely on their parents or other adults to help them cope, cope with their grief and their fear. The terrifying nature of these attacks has prompted schools to enlist the helps of counselors for the kids. Thomas Nybo has that. You want to protect your kids. They are small and the world is big and sometimes very bad things happen to good people even when they wear a helmet and look both ways. If things go wrong, horribly wrong, what do you do? On the first day back to class since the attacks, the tragedy was very much on the minds of New Yorkers. For this father, a reminder of how a seven-year-old sees the world. The, he was uh, quite intrigued that the Empire State Building is now the second tallest building. And he kept saying that over and over again. So, uh, and that's appropriate. And I had to kind of scale back and not try and lecture him on the significance of the event. He's seven. He's dealing, it, dealing with it the way a seven-year-old should. For Steve Ross's 13-year-old daughter, a complicated start to a new school year. It's hard to get now back into the routine. We hadn't figured out a routine to begin with yet, so to try to get back to a routine that was never there is kind of difficult. Even for someone who's made the United States a recent home, similar issues with her 10-year-old son. He made up that he was fighting against a terrorist, so he was uh, working with like fake guns at home and uh, hiding behind furniture and, and just making up like how he will defend the country. Around the corner, long after classes had ended for the day, a private school for girls held a crash course for parents on how to help your child face the unthinkable. Counselors offered ways to listen when your child isn't speaking. We have children who are not necessarily the most verbal, some who are not able to articulate things in words. We need to take a look at the drawings they draw, the way they play with their dolls in their room, things that they may be saying to their friends. We basically shielded her from the whole thing. Questions from parents looking for ways to explain to their children what really happened. Terrible evil happened in the world. A very, very bad thing took place. And we're all doing our best to get back to a comfort and a safety. The final questions come in a flurry. They needed to get home early. It was, after all, a school night. Thomas Nibo, CNN, New York. And that should be a good opening to this uh, next segment in our discussion, uh, reactions to what's been going on over the last four days. Now back to Donna. Jim, you're so right, and Colleen, thanks very much. We'll, can, we'll carry on with the children. Certainly, you want to protect your children from evil. We do, but it would be really almost impossible to shield them from what's been happening in New York City and Washington. How should we be talking with our children about these tragedies? From Los Angeles, we are joined by child psychologist Robert Butterworth. Dr. Butterworth uh, has assisted radio, TV, and print media since 1984 to try and enhance the, uh, the understanding, really, of what a child goes through when they get into a, a psychological uh, issue and, and the trauma that they face. Dr. Butterworth, thanks for, for coming to talk with us. Hello, Donna. First things first, 
What do you do? Maybe they've you, seen the images. So, so how do you open the door with a child? Well, first of all, you know why it's so hard? Because it, it, for all these adults that are struggling, because in a sense we fail them. You know, we bring these children into the world and we give them this perception that all is well, everyone is good, and all of a sudden something like this happens. So the child that runs up to my uh, wife, who's a teacher, who's 10 years old, it says something like, what did we do that made them so mad? or the other child that is so quiet in the play and won't say anything but builds little blocks like a tower and then smashes them down so they're All afraid they're in trouble or they've yes, done we, something well you know the problem is that in, in a sense little children don't verbalize we don't sit and talk like you and i do with little children they won't talk to you but we'll, what you'll do is get some paper get some crayons get some pencils and say gee what's been happening on tv when they draw they'll talk and then you'll find out what they think. And even those kids that aren't talking about it, there's something in their head and they're thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Should you force a child to talk if they're not talking to you? Should you try to draw them out? No, that's why we're using play. Because by playing with them, they're having fun anyhow. At a certain age, like you're saying, the younger kids, you need the paper okay. and crayons. So, right. so maybe we could kind of make it age appropriate. Okay, that's what we're going to talk. Okay, the, the drawings and the, and the play and all that, we're about seven and younger. Mm -hmm. From about seven to 12, a lot of kids are going to be kind of stuck on one thing. Remember, it used to be with post-traumatic stress that you would get it if you were exposed to it, if you were there and you couldn't get the image out of your head. But in this new technology, you don't have to be there. You can be exposed in your living room. You're sitting there watching these buildings come down and people jumping. So there are a lot of kids that are, that are quiet, but they want to talk about it. So what you do is you spend a little time, and you know even at the age of about 7 to 12, they're not going to sit and talk, but maybe at the dinner table. Have a little briefing. Everybody goes around the table and says how they feel about it. And if everybody else does it, maybe the kids will start to open up. Mm -hmm. One of the most important words, listen, right? And it's hard, and as we get, especially with the older ones, because mm -hmm. the older ones are going to be arguing. Remember, teenagers want action. They want something to happen. And they may be mad at mad, mom and dad. Why didn't, we, why didn't you fix this? And, or, well, let's get them. So there's a lot more anger and a lot more energy and a lot more intensity. We're going to talk about some of those emotions. Let's get a call in here. Liz from West Virginia. Hi. Hi. Um, when I put my daughter to bed tonight, um, she just kind of looked at me with tears in her eyes, and she asked me, Mommy, why does this man hate us so much? What am I supposed to say to that child? She's Bob? only nine. Bob? Yeah? What should she say? She put her daughter uh, uh, to bed, uh, nine years old. She was in tears saying, why does this man hate us so much? And she wants to know what she can do. Okay, well, first of all, you have to remember that most of the kids that are going to be having problems are going to be having problems at nighttime. No matter what happens in the daytime, they keep busy. And at night, this is where all the fears come up. You really have to say that there are bad people in the world, but most of the people are good. The people around you are good. The people that you know you go to school with are good. And you have to kind of, in a sense, drown out the bad with the good. There's no perfect answer. But by letting them know that their environment and their surroundings are filled with good people, and there are bad people, they can cope because they put it in a, some sort of perspective. Mm -hmm. But nighttime is going to be difficult because that's when things get dark. Remember, all the kids' fears come out and all their little fantasies. Okay, so we talk about fear, loss. Maybe some, maybe some kids have lost their parents. And I've seen some of the women who are even expecting babies who will never know uh, their fathers. There's hate, there's anger, there's sadness. I, I, and I know it depends on the child and depends on the age. What would you recommend uh, to, to really, is there kind of something that you could, a point that you can start that, that really makes sense for a lot of kids, uh, that, that, that they really will understand to, to cover a range of emotions? Well, depending on what the emotion is, because remember with children, when they feel stress, it's completely different than adults. When adults are under stress and, de and, and depression, they slow down. Kids speed up. So kids are going to be fighting, they're going to be hyper, they're going to have difficulty concentrating. They're also going to have problems physically, appetite, they're going to be crying, they're going to be clinging. So all these things happen with kids and you just deal with each one at one time. With the food, maybe have different feedings. With the bed, maybe have them sleep closer to you. With the concentration, maybe limit school. But generally with most kids who haven't lost a parent, who haven't been exposed directly to the threat, these things should even off. 
But Donna, the problem is, in most tragedies, things start to even off, but things are going so fast. We're just finishing with this, and all of a sudden we're talking about war. So in a sense, now kids are getting frightened, not because of the images that they see, but all this talk of war, and that's another trauma coming down the road. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Try to keep to as normal a routine as you can, but be flexible if they need you or want to sleep in the same bed with mommy and daddy, that's okay? Research in all types of tragedies, all types of devastation, one thing keeps coming up. Try to remember as much as you can to get back to normal routine. Mm -hmm. Anything that has to do with structure, anything that has to do with the way things were before, that's so important. Mm -hmm. Okay, on the phone with us is Holly from Arkansas. Hi, Holly, what's your question? Hello, um, yes, my children, when I brought them home from school, I had Donna, sat them down and I had told them everything. I did not lie to them. Um, I told them everything. They are only eight and nine years old. And I was wondering, was that an appropriate thing for me to do? You, you did tell them everything you say? Yes, ma'am. And probably in a way that was, uh, you said they were eight and ten? Eight and nine. Eight and nine, okay. And, and were they frightened? Um, my nine-year-old started crying. And I asked her, I, I said, you need to let me know what you're afraid of, mm -hmm. okay. that way that I can explain it to her. Okay, let me, let me, uh, I think Dr. Butterworth is having trouble hearing our caller. So now, now it's fine. Okay, well Holly in Arkansas said that uh, she has the eight and nine year old, if you missed the first part of it, and they were asking her about it, and she told them really in a way she thought was appropriate, told them everything, and she said, should she have? Was that the right thing to do? Yes, and a, and a lot of people don't like this. They would like to say, you know, why shouldn't we just protect our children from this? Let's turn off the TV. Let's pretend it's not happening. But and shouldn't you, at a certain away. at a certain uh, age and a certain amount that you tell them, is there a protection factor that should should come up there? Well, obviously, the protection factor are kids that aren't exposed to other kids that aren't going to school yet, and that's obviously uh, kids under kindergarten and that way. But the problem is for saying, for not talking about it and not discussing it, kids go back into the school, kids go back into their environment, and let's face it, this is the biggest story in the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. We're not going to hide it. And remember, it's what kids don't know that hurt them, not what they know. And if you don't tell them the facts, they'll fantasize their own version of reality, which in many cases is much worse than the events that are occurring. Mm -hmm. I've got a, a baby and a 20-year-old. Major Garrett, I know you have a couple of kids. Are they extra worried? What have you told them? Because you're covering the White House, and if they heard maybe that the White House might have been a target and the president was in danger, are they worried about Daddy? Well, Don, I have three children, six, four, and 17 months. And um, Mr. Butterworth might uh, argue with my methods here, but I have imposed a complete news blackout at my house. Do they know anything I... about it before you impose the blackout? Well, my son, Luke, who's four, uh, the day that uh, this tragedy happened, came home from school early, and he said to my wife, Julie, I heard there was an explosion. Can we get some popcorn so we can sit and watch it on television? Mm -hmm. He thought it was fireworks. Mm -hmm. That's how my four-year-old reacted. He thought this was about fireworks. And uh, I was not at home at the time. I was in Sarasota, Florida, covering the president, and my wife and I talked about this a good deal, and I said, look, um, we cannot explain this to them. They're six and four. I'm at the White House. The president is under a higher degree of threat than he's ever been. And I don't want them to worry about me. And I don't want them to get the sense that the world is crashing down around them. Thirdly, we travel to California twice a year to see their grandparents. We fly by plane. I in no way wanted them to see pictures of airplanes crashing into buildings because I want them to associate everything about these trips positively. Mm -hmm. Getting on a plane to see their grandparents. It's a big ritual for us. It's a huge deal twice a year to make this trip. And I'll tell you, Major, I think a lot of people would agree with you, but that's what Dr. Butterworth was just saying. Dr. Butterworth, what about that? In fact, you say your four-year-old came home and had already found out about it. What about that? Major would rather that his children not know about this, particularly flying to see the grandparents, and keep it a, a pleasant and, and lovely experience. And, and he would rather that they not find out anything about it. And for the four-year-old, that's probably work, workable, and, and he's right. I'd rather that his children not find out about it either. But the problem with the, little, the, the six-year-old, if the six-year-old's in school, when the parents aren't there, they're going to they're be talking about it. Then what do you do? Yeah, what do Major, you do what's, your, what's your plan back? B? 
Well, uh, Mary Ellen, my six-year-old, uh, has been back at school just for one day, uh, Thursday. She was off Wednesday, as many classes were around the country. She was also off today, as it happened, because there was a uh, teacher training day built into the schedule. So she's only been at school for one day this week, and it really wasn't a big topic of conversation in her first grade class. And my decision and my wife's decision has not been to lead with this information, not to bring it to her attention. Uh, we haven't had the radio on. What television we have had on has been uh, movies on the VCR. And I'll tell you, there was one poignant moment. We were watching The Sound of Music, which has become a very popular movie with my two children. They know all the songs. And Mary Ellen, my daughter, said, you know, why did the Von Trapp family have to leave Austria? Why did they want to come to America? And of course, that's a myth built into the movie that the Von Trapp family fled not the Nazi occupation of Austria by climbing over the mountains. But nevertheless, it's an important part of the movie. And here I am explaining to her the importance of someone at another time coming to America for freedom and liberty and a chance to live a life of their dreams, while in my professional life, I'm dealing with the fact that thousands of my countrymen have been killed for that very same reason amidst this horror. And personally, I'm dealing with that much more than she is. And I'll take that burden and try to spare her from it as much as I can. Let's talk to Betsy in Virginia. She's a teacher. Betsy, hello. Hi. Um, I'm a sixth grade teacher, and I'm just wondering how much is appropriate for me to discuss at school opposed to what they're hearing at home. Betsy, did you say fifth or sixth grade? I'm sorry. Sixth grade. They're in an elementary school, but they're sixth grade. Okay. Bob, what do you think? What's well, appropriate let's there? Let's see. They're sixth grade, so they're probably about 12 years old. Probably the best thing to do, because kids get a little nervous and anxious, and they, they kind of never know when to talk about it, when not to. Maybe, again, talking about this with your school, set a little period of time every day. Call it a news briefing and sit down, make sure you have maps because you, you need to put things in perspective where things are happening and let them just talk about it. But it's a special time every day, the same time. You don't necessarily show the images. You just talk about how you're feeling and you try to correct the errors that they may have. Remember, kids sometimes don't know geography. So they may think, oh my God, the buildings are dropping not hundreds of miles away, but blocks away. So those kinds of mis uh, uh, conceptions can be cleared up. But again, one has to be kind of careful about this because some parents may get upset. And, mm -hmm. and that's why my, my feeling is it's probably better for the parent to do it only because in our society, uh, the parents have to do the tough job. And the tough job is breaking news to kids that this is not always a happy and pleasant world. And as we mentioned before, the president talked about how it would be a monumental battle between the forces of evil and good, but that good would win out. Do you address that? Do you talk about evil versus good? My God, it sounds like a Star Wars scenario, but you know, that's how kids are understanding this. I mean, kids don't have any history or any uh, sense of war in reality. They see war on television, they see war in movies, and they have these battles between good and evil. And, and I think kids have that sense, but uh, I think you have to just slowly approach that and let the child lead. And please, if a child doesn't want to talk about it and they get really upset, stop and say yes but when we when you do want to talk i'm here another phone call chip from philadelphia hi chip hi go right ahead uh, yeah i'm a father and a grandfather and, and I've, I've learned a long time ago that uh, children are born to love you really have to work hard to teach them how to hate and if more of our world leaders would uh, maybe visit a daycare and, and watch the children we might not have so many troubles in the world uh, because just children just don't hate. You have to teach them how to do that. What about that, Bob? Uh, kids, you're right. Kids don't hate, but, but kids get angry and they understand when people, adults get angry. Remember, a lot of the youngsters right now are feeling what the parents are feeling. Parents are angry and then you wonder why your, your, your kid is angry or parents are kind of shocked and then you wonder why your kid's anxious. So really getting a sense of what's going on has a lot to do with, first of all, getting your own thoughts together, getting your own emotions together and then going to the child. 
But you're right, and that's why it's so difficult to do this because, as, as you, you, your correspondent was telling us, I mean, he doesn't want us to tell his kids. I don't, I don't either. But my God, this is the world that we we gave them. I don't blame I, I don't blame the teenagers for being mad at us because, in a sense, we didn't fix it, and it's their job to to now make it a better place. Mm -hmm. You know, we've kind of touched on this a little bit when we're talking about routines and and uh, the little girl who was put to bed who was in tears, and and you can tell there are some fears. What do you watch for in a child to see if they are struggling with this? The child's mood will change. You know, if you know your child, you know kind of how they feel when they get upset. You know, the general mood. If you notice that there's been a change, the child's either more quiet or more hyper. If a child is, is afraid to go to bed at night, if is kind of hesitant, if the child is uh, having problems eating, especially if the child doesn't want to, you notice the child's around you a lot more. They keep looking at you. They don't want to leave your sight because remember, for a child, there are two senses of uh, uh, two self uh, senses of uh, security: the physical environment and the parents. And both of these are threatened in this disaster. Okay, Sally from Virginia is on the phone with us. Hi, Sally. Hi, I'm calling uh, from Virginia Beach. Uh, this is a major military facility, and uh, we've got a lot of kids that uh, have parents that are in the military and are being affected directly by this. Um, I have a child that I've been watching for a couple of days here. She's nine. She's uh, real concerned because her dad's also involved. Um, so I guess we sat down and talked to her. And the, the best we could come up with for a nine-year-old is that this is a neighborhood bully. This is the world's bully. And the only way we can talk about it at that point is it's not for her to worry about it, that the adults will handle the bullies. Is, is that affected, Bob? Now, here you have a whole different situation. Kids with military families, that adds an extra worry. Yeah, and it's a new worry. And, and the kids have not even gotten integrated in terms of this disaster. And now we're getting uh, troops uh, called up, uh, reserves called up. And, and now, the, now we have a whole other sense of, of kids getting anxious. And, and we actually addressed that during the Gulf War. We had kids that couldn't talk about this, so we actually got little toy trucks, little toy soldiers, and we had them kind of play act what they were feeling. Some kids were so mad, we actually got a Saddam Hussein puppet and had them kick it and punch it and all that because they were all getting all the anger out that way. But the point is, you have to tell them little bits. Just let them know when they ask you a question, answer it. But don't keep talking when they're kind of phased out. But uh, again, we have another group of kids here who are now getting another uh, anxiety and worry. Their dad is going to have to fight these bad people. Mm -hmm. And then the kids who have lost a parent, perhaps, uh, in, in the uh, horrific terrorist action on Tuesday. Uh, and then that may spill over into other children who are afraid that they could lose their mom and dad. What about those kids? It, it, well, I mean, we're talking about two separate groups here. I mm -hmm. mean, the, the tragedy of, of people who lose loved ones. I mean, this is a long-term uh, therapy uh, situation. I mean, this, this is something that's just devastating for a child to lose their mother or father. And this isn't something that we can, you know, talk about in little tips. It's just a question of these people are going to need long-term professional help. Well, and that's one of the things I wanted to ask you, too. I mean, it could be, uh, we say moms and dads, but it could be moms, dads, grandparents, uncles, aunts, you know, brothers, sisters, all the people who have been hurting so greatly. How long do you keep talking to kids? Do you keep talking to adults? Do you keep offering this support? Research shows that after disasters such as Oklahoma City, years after, they see alcohol rates go up, divorce rates go up, uh, uh, domestic abuse goes up. When the counselors, as they're descending into New York and Washington, start doing their therapy, they have to remember, don't leave. Don't go in a month when this story may be not be, not be the primary uh, thing to focus on because they're going to need struck a, a permanent counseling centers for a long time, especially for those people that not just lost loved ones, but people that knew loved ones and had families or had groups of friends at the workplace. And now they're left and no one else is there. Yeah, the kids who are frightened, the adults who are frightened, it'll go on and maybe go through even stages of grief. Uh, things that we may not even know of because this is much more horrific than what we've studied in the past. Your best advice to someone who's suffering tonight or has children to talk to, uh, listen. Listen, love, and I know it's not very fashionable for therapists to say, but go to church and, and, and pray and, and talk to people that you haven't talked with before and, 
and just get other people to help you hold yourself up because you can't do it alone. Yep, been a lot of that going on. Need to keep it up. Bob Butterworth, child psychologist, joining us from Los Angeles tonight. A pleasure to have you with us and try to, to help us with this and, and help other folks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Donna. And uh, Dr. Butterworth, along with our other guests, certainly for these last couple of hours, want to thank them as well. General Wesley Clark, MJ Gohel of the Asia Pacific Foundation, and of course, thanking all of you. We're so glad that you could be with us tonight. If you called in, and even if you didn't get